All right, thank you. Um, so my talk is about connecting. So connecting sciences, scientists, research managers in the community. And since I'm a scientist, I'm going to talk a little about a little bit about my research and then tie into how my research is even possible with, um, and then talk about Eyes of the Reef um, as the foundation for why my research is even possible. So I'm going to talk about corals because that's what I do research on. And I'm going to talk about specifically coral disease. I'm going to do a little bit of background. I don't know how many of you already know about coral physiology, but um, the coral is a pretty amazing animal. Uh, it's related to the anemone. Um, so the basic unit is the polyp, which is the picture on the left. So they have tentacles, connects to a gut, um, and that's the basic animal. But inside the cells, all corals have microscopic algae that takes energy from the sun, turns it into sugars, gives most of that sugar back to the coral, and in return, that algae gets a nice, safe environment. It's a really good symbi symbiosis, and it allows corals to grow in places where there otherwise isn't very many nutrients to feed on. And then the coral animal is just a collection of all these polyps connected, working together. So if we back up a little bit, you can see the polyps, little flower-like structures. And if you back up a little more, you start seeing kind of the rock-like structure that people think of when they see corals. And eventually, if they can grow long enough, they'll become this nice, big, beautiful colony. Um, and that's what you know, snorkelers and scuba divers, we all like to see out on the reef. Unfortunately, coral reefs have been declining over the past several decades. And there's a variety of threats that threaten corals, um, one of which is coral diseases. Um, so to think of disease in a really simple animal like this is kind of hard to imagine. But if you think of getting gangrene or a flesh-eating bacteria, and it just eats away at your you know, muscle tissues, that's kind of what it looks like when corals get disease. They lose their tissue. Um, and this is a big problem because, you know, 30 years ago, we maybe saw patches of coral disease here and there. 2004, reports have been coming all over the world. That's a map from 2004. It's now 2015. I imagine if you did the same kind of report, there'd be even more dots, even, th you know, all over. And if you can see, Hawaii is no exemption to spotting coral disease. So this is why I'm really passionate about this particular kind of threat to coral reefs because they can be really devastating. So this is what coral disease looks like up close. Um, on the right side of this piece of the coral, you can see the polyps. They're kind of retracted into the skeleton. But this part of the coral is nice and healthy. It has a nice brown color. You can see the flower-like structures of the polyp. But on this side, that all that tissue is gone, and all that's left is the skeleton that the coral lays down. Uh, and then you can see this interface. And then at this interface, there's probably a bacterium that's producing toxins and eating away the tissues. And eventually, the coral either has to fight this off and stop the progression of that lesion, or the lesion will just continue until there's no more tissue for that bacteria to feed on. Um, this is really bad because corals take a really long time to grow, several decades, centuries even. But a bacterium like this can kill a coral in weeks, months, sometimes days. So that's a lot of loss of growth compacted in a very short time. It takes a long time for reefs to recover from a disturbance like this. I study um, one particular disease. There are several types of coral diseases in Hawaii. I think there's been over 17 documented. But one of the most severe and widely spread is what we call Montipora white syndrome. And that's just kind of our fancy name. White syndrome means it's tissue loss. So you see the white skeleton of the coral once the tissue has been lost. And Montipra is just the scientific name for the type of coral is affected. So Montipra is the Hawaiian rice coral. Um, and this example of one, it's normally that nice orange red color. And then this whole part of the colony has been eaten away. And that's where the, the lesion is still progressing. This uh, disease was first documented in Kaneohe Bay. And it's been reported from other islands, but it's the most prevalent in Kanye Bay. So that's where we study it the most. Um, there's two different types that we see. Uh, one is present pretty much all the time. We call it chronic because it moves really slowly. The lesion is, itself is rather small, and it takes a long time for it to kill a coral. But every once in a while, we get really fast-acting, um, acute outbreaks where instead of killing a coral in 
months to years, it kills a coral in like days to weeks. So this coral right here is maybe as big as this table and half of it is dead or dying. And three days later, it was completely dead. Yeah. <laughs> so this is really important. The, the, how fast these corals die makes it hard to catch these outbreaks sometimes. Um, and that's where connecting people comes in handy, as I'll talk about in a little bit. So for my research, I want to try to take a medical, you know, epidemiological approach to this. So you can only get disease when you have a pathogen that can invade a host that usually becomes susceptible for whatever reason. And, and it can only do so if there's a conducive environment. And that environment either allows the pathogen to invade or that environment makes the host susceptible. So there's three angles that you can really like study disease. And I try to study Montefiore White syndrome from all three of those angles. And I'm gonna go through some of the components of my dissertation that get at these three angles. And since my lab started working on this d disease in 2004, we've done a lot of work. We know where this disease is. We see, not really seasonality, but we think it might be correlated with heavy rains. We've identified three different bacteria that can cause tissue loss in corals in the lab. So we've done a lot of work already, but there's still a lot of questions that we need to answer if we want to try to mitigate this disease. And that is what my dissertation is all about. Um, the first chapter is involving the susceptible host. Um, what was interesting when we first stud started studying this disease is um, this is the rice coral. This is two colonies of it. And you can see there's different colors. This is a lighter, what we call orange color. And then this is a kind of a brick red color. They're the same species. So, but we just call them different color morphs. And if you just go out and snorkel on the reefs and count how many Montebro there are, most of the time you're gonna find lots of the red morph. But if you only count the corals that are getting sick, most of the time that's gonna be the orange morph which doesn't really make much sense unless for some reason the orange morph is just more susceptible to getting bacterial infections. So that kind of makes, gives us a little model system to look at what are the risk factors for this coral getting diseased. So that comes from the susceptible host side. I'm gonna put up some data, but really what you need to know is I was basically, what's different between these two color morphs? I looked at how fast they grow, how much algal, this microscopic algae, how much of that is in their cells, um, how many eggs and sperm, and how many offspring do they um, spawn during the summer? Is there a difference in how much they eat with their tentacles that might allow one color morph to get more energy than the other? Uh, and then how much like, you know, lipid or fat reserves they store up, to, you know, to help them kind of fight um, different stresses. And really what I found was that a lot of the times they were the same, except in two things that I measured. So the red morph I found grew faster and was able to make more offspring, even though they seemed to have the same amount of energy input. So that was really interesting. Another component of my research that involves this susceptible host is I wanted to look at the bacteria. So I'm a microbiologist and I understand that bacteria are really important in health in humans, other animals, and it's starting to be known that it's bacteria are really important for the health of corals. So I wanted to see, well, do these two color morphs also have similar bacteria? And it turns out they don't. <laughs> so this, these graphs certain just, just show that if this was a coral fragment and I measured all of the bacteria on it, the distance between these two dots kind of represents how different those bacterial communities were. And I can draw a nice solid line right in between my orange and red samples. And if I looked at what kind of bacteria were different, the orange morph, which was the one that was getting sick more often, had a lot more Vibrio. And if you know anything about Vibrio, they're usually associated as pathogens. They are pathogens of us, Vibrio cholera can cause cholera. Fish, oysters, shrimp, just about any marine invertebrate you can possibly think of, there's probably a Vibrio that can infect it, including coral. So that could possibly explain why the orange morph is getting sick more often because it's simply harboring bacteria that aren't very good for it. So kind of the take home message from that component is that the red color morph may be more robust. So if you want to try to re have reefs recover, maybe we'll want to outplant um, the red color morph to help uh, keep those outplants from dying off in the future. 
Um, but we have to be careful because there could be trade-offs with disease resistance. Maybe they don't handle other types of stresses as well. Um, but really, it's really cool because we can effectively study this, this disease because of the differential susceptibility. Um, for my aims that are involving the pathogen, um, I'm not trying to find any pathogens because we've found plenty already. What was more I was interested in is how the coral is getting exposed to these harmful bacteria in the first place. Um, because that's something we could definitely stop if they're coming in from land, which has been suggested in other coral disease systems. That's something we can definitely do something about. If it's being harbored by any particular vector, then maybe we can manage those populations. Um, so I went about screening just about anything I could get my hands on. <laughs> I screened stream water flowing into Kanye Bay, the seawater itself, all these different organisms, and the coral host itself. And not every individual, but every different type of sample I chose to screen, I found one of our pathogens in every single type of sample. Um, so always I find a pathogen in the seawater. I found it on butterfly fish, which eat coral, feather duster worms that bore into coral skeletons and brush against them, shrimp and goby fish that kind of make homes out of the coral uh, structure and actually do touch the coral itself. And I even found pathogens in the coral. A few of our pathogens are vibrios. So that wasn't too surprising with my sequence data um, to actually find the pathogen itself on the coral. So basically kind of what to get out of this is that the Hawaiian rice coral is probably continually exposed to pathogens all the time. This is not really something new. We have pathogens on our skin, Staph aureus, but we don't get sick until either we're really sick from something else and it can take over or we get like a really nasty cut and then it can, has a way to get in. So we're thinking that maybe limiting exposure of these pathogens isn't really gonna be feasible. They're already in the environment, they're already everywhere. Rather, we need to probably try to make the water quality better so that corals can just be more robust on their own. Um, so all that I've been doing in the last four and a half years that I've been a graduate student, and the last kind of chapter of what I'm going to do is look at the environment side. So we know that heavy water, heavy rainwater events are, have been linked to disease outbreaks in the past, and heavy rain events bring in a lot of fresh water and a lot of sediment out into Kaneohe Bay. Um, so I'm looking at to see if salinity of a reduced salinity and if you stress out the coral sedimentation is that going to allow the pathogens to infect easier because normally we have to throw a lot of bacteria at a coral in the lab to get it to infect and that doesn't really mimic natural conditions so i want to really get at what are some of the environmental triggers that are causing some of these outbreaks so it's kind of a little bit about me and what i do um, but really none of this new knowledge that we could potentially use would be possible. It wouldn't be possible without well, a lot of people. But first, other scientists. So this is a picture of my lab. Um, in particular, they're awesome. And we do a lot of great work as a team looking into coral disease. But it also wouldn't be possible without resource managers. So this is a picture of Jason, who is in the Department of Aquatic Resources. Uh, I've worked with him a lot in field studies. We've bounced ideas off each other, and he's really interested in some of the findings that I've gotten. Um, and of course, just ocean users. I need people from the community to help me do my science. And I'm going to talk about how, <laughs> how that's possible. And that's possible through a program called Eyes of the Reef. So we are we're not a monitoring group. We are a report network. And I've been involved with this program for several years now. And we're a network that helps um, the state of Hawaii scientists who are interested in coral reefs to uh, know when uh, events are happening, whether that's disease, whether that's bleaching, when there's symbionts leave, when it's crown of thorns, and other marine invasive species. Um, and this is because, you know, Kaneohe Bay is kind of my domain. I'm there all the time. I pretty much know what the reefs around Coconut Island look like. So I'm pretty well aware um, when things change. But I'm never on the North Shore. I'm never in Kewala Basin. I'm, I'm never on the other islands, right? So I would have no idea what was happening on the reefs there. 
And it's the same for resource managers. There's only so many of them. They can only be in so many places. So we really need people, sorry, who are ocean lovers, who are already in the ocean, to really just use their eyes, know what a coral reef is supposed to look like, so that when things change, someone can know about it. Because if we don't know how things are changing, we can't do anything about it, basically. And that's the whole purpose of this program, and it's to involve the whole community and not only reporting coral disease, but hopefully recruiting the community so that we can do something about it. Um, I'm gonna give you some examples of how well this program has worked. So just talking about Montefiore White Syndrome, there's been several big outbreaks of the acute, really fast acting form. One in 2010, which actually was reported to us by an Eyes of the Reef member, Bobby, who was a boat driver in Kaneohe Bay. Uh, that was a really small outbreak. We responded to it and found about 300 coral colonies in the entire bay affected. Another outbreak came in January 2012, again spotted by Bobby, a boat driver in Kaneohe Bay. And then we responded to it and found over triple the amount of coral colonies affected by this disease. Unfortunately, just this past February, yet another disease outbreak happened in Kaneohe Bay. And this one was actually reported by the Department of Aquatic Resources because they were out there doing their super sucker project and releasing urchins out into these reefs and they noticed a disease outbreak. But this one was different. It happened in a different part of the bay than the previous two outbreaks. So most of us, like myself, were on the alert in the Southern Bay. because That's where the previous outbreaks had occurred. But because they were working in different places, they were able to spot a new outbreak in a new place. And I don't have the numbers for that one, but um, of the reefs that were affected, they documented 90% of the colonies. So I can't tell you how many hundreds of colonies that is, but that's a pretty startling number. Um, Eyes of the Reef is about more than just coral disease, um, though that is a main focus. Uh, well, more than just one white syndrome. Um, a coral disease on Kauai has gotten a lot of news lately. Uh, it's even gotten some news in Los Angeles, and it was reported to us from an Eyes of the Reef member on Who Lives on Kauai. I had never been to Kauai before this report came and was able to help respond to it, so I would have never been able to know as a scientist that this was going on. Um, this affects the same coral as the disease I study, except it looks a little different, right? You can see this black band, and there was coral here, and it's moving in a semicircular pattern. That is actually the pathogen. That black man, there's so much bacteria there, you can actually see the pathogen moving across coral. And this was first reported to us in 2012. And since then, we have not only figured out where it is and how it's distributed around Kauai, we figured out what the pathogen is and gosh, so many other stuff. I mean, but now that we know what bacterium is causing this, we can try to figure out where it's coming from, how to stop it, what's triggering these diseases. Um, so coral disease, but also coral bleaching. Um, I talked about those algal symbionts that live inside the coral. They give them so much, they give them almost all the food a coral needs, and that gives the coral its brown color. So when those um, algal cells are stressed out from too much UV light or too high temperatures, they leave, and then the coral turns white, but the tissue is still there. So that's kind of what bleaching looks like. Um, in 2014, this past year, during the summer, it got really hot, it was really hot for a long time, and we had a massive bleaching event all over the main Hawaiian Islands. And through Eyes of the Reef, we were able to document, you know, which, which islands, which part of the islands were suffering from bleaching. And pretty much all across the board, all the islands were suffering from this bleaching event. We would not have been able to know that unless people were reporting it in. Not just resource managers, not just scientists, but community members who are out there surfing and snorkeling and scuba diving. We also want to be on the lookout for crown of thorns sea stars. So these are invertebrates that eat coral. So they're predators of coral. And in low numbers, they're, they're fine. Um, they're, you know, they're supposed to be here. But in large numbers, they can do a lot of damage in a short time. And that's, again, another event where you kind of have to catch it quickly. Otherwise, it's, the damage has been done. So for example, in 2005 and 2012, Eyes of the Reef members reported crown of thorns outbreaks and um, people were recruited to go and remove the animals off the reef itself. We also want to keep an eye out for alien invasive species and this is normally algae. So there's several different types of algae that are harmful to Hawaii's reefs and eyes of the reef can help you identify those different types of algaes 
um, and help you distinguish them from native algae that are okay. Uh, and we'll, you can learn how to report those. Uh, there's also native species blooms. So there's several organisms that are supposed to be in Hawaii. They're native here, but when they all of a sudden grow to really high density, it can be a problem for corals. And usually, more importantly, it's indicative of a change in the environment somehow. So it would be good to know what that change was. So Isla Reef is kind of two-tiered. Uh, the first tier is just the level one involvement, and that's for anyone who's in the ocean, who loves the ocean. Uh, we would train you how to, well, first we would train you, what does a cor normal coral reef look like? What are the common species of coral on Hawaiian reefs? So you have a good sense of what should be out there. And then we would talk about these dangers, coral disease, coral bleaching, crown of thorns, alien invasive species. And we would kind of walk you through, how do you tell the difference between these? How do you know what is a big disease outbreak and what is just predation maybe that kind of looks like disease? And then we would show you how to go um, report it to the Eyes of the Reef Network. And once you put in a report, actually that is kind of linked to the Department of Aquatic Resources and we can activate a response and usually that is going out and documenting, but in some cases it's actually trying to mitigate. So in the case of crown of thorns, we go out and remove animals. Um, for Kauai, the coral disease there, we've actually tried putting epoxy down on the corals to stop the lesion from moving with some success. <laughs> so I imagine something like that might be implemented in the future. And also with this level one involvement, as you report changes to the reefs to us, we can have a really good database of what is changing so we can make really big plans about how to protect all of Hawaii's reefs. Level two involvement is a little more hands-on. So these are for people who are more comfortable in the water, who are snorkelers, who are scuba divers. And not only would we kind of refresh you on the, the these five threats to the coral reef, but we'd actually take you in the field, um, let you visualize coral disease firsthand, let you visualize some of these invasive species firsthand, get you really honed in, um, really knowledgeable. But then we would also have you learn how to respond. So if someone sent in a report from the Big Island saying, oh man, I saw all these crown of thorns and you happen to live on the Big Island and I'm stuck here, I'd be like, call you up and say, hey, can you, can you go verify that this person actually saw a crown of thorns and not some other a tire that you know has been underwater for a while and accumulating stuff? Um, so that would be the role of a level two person in Eyes of the Reef. You can confirm the details of a level one report. And if a response is mounted by the state, then we also try to recruit people to help them, whether that's doing surveys, collecting samples, you know, kind of a call to arms. And recently we actually had our first inaugural class of the level two. Um, training and some of it was the people from DAR, the, aqua the invasive species team, but we had some people who were just undergraduates at UH Manoa. We had Catherine Cruz, who's part of KT, or the news channels here. I don't have cable, so I don't, <laughs> don't watch it, unfortunately. But um, so we were hoping to do more and more of these in the future, and we really want to get as many people involved who not only can recognize the threats, but know how to go out and photograph it and document it. So this was a fun class. We I took out some weights um, that were numbered and I scattered them about a known section of reef. And I said, hey, there's a crown of thorns outbreak. Go tell me how many are out there and how much of the reef they're affecting. So that's a, an exercise that they go through so that if they were responding to a real crown of thorns outbreak, we'd be able to get a lot of really good information in a really short amount of time so we can mount the most effective response possible. So that is what Eyes of the Reef is all about. And that is how we have been connecting science with resource managers, with community members, because without reports from Eyes of the Reef, everything that I am doing as a scientist wouldn't have been possible. I would not have known about the outbreaks, how they're linked to heavy rain events. I would have not known to start screening organisms. I would have not known to you know, concentrate on South Kanyue Bay because that's where Monte Pearl White Syndrome is the most. We would have not known to go to Kauai to like investigate this change to their reefs. So it's really important that the community is on board and not only reporting, but getting involved in the science 
I've actually had two interns who were originally I was the Reef members who wanted to do more, and I was able to take them on as, as interns, and they did really good science of their own. So if you want to get more involved, uh, first of all, I have a sign-in sheet over there. If you want to be on our mailing list, you can give me your information. I will make sure you get news updates. Um, we have a website, which is much more detailed about what Eyes of the Reef is, has much more um, resources if you wanted to look up coral diseases. Um, we have links to news sources, uh, DAR reports, and stuff like that. But we also have a Facebook page, because who doesn't have a Facebook page? Mm -hmm. Um, and oftentimes the call to arms comes through here. So if you are if you were already a member, you could look here and see, oh, okay, someone's starting to see bleaching, I'll keep my eye out. Or, hey, we're having a training session soon. We advertise it quite heavily here, but of course, if you're on our mailing list, you would get it there. So Eyes of the Reef, the level one involvement, we give two hour training sessions, they're free. Um, they're done by people like me. And I think they're fun. I think people enjoy learning about the coral reefs and it's great to get as many people involved as possible. So that is pretty much the end of my talk. I kept it kind of sort and sweet for you guys, but I would happy to take any questions at all and talk to you more about Eyes of the Reef or my research or any other opportunities for you guys to get involved. So thank you. Is it rice, R-I-C-E, is that how we spell that? Yeah, the rice coral. It, it's called rice coral because, um, let's see if I can, yeah, this is pretty fast. The way it makes, it lay down its skeleton, it makes these little bumps. And, they, and there's not a lot of tissue on those bumps. So they're kind of whitish in color. You see the little bumps. They kind of look like grains of rice sticking out of the coral. So that's kind of the common name for Montifera species. Yeah. I didn't hear what you said. <clears throat> what did you put on Kauai to stop the outbreak? Okay, so what we did on Kauai is we took a marine epoxy. So you, you know, there's like two component things. You mix them together and they harden like a cement. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we went out and scraped off that black purple lesion. So take away the pathogen at that site. So we scraped, we scraped this away. And then on top of it, we put down a big band of that epoxy on the lesion, a little bit ahead of the lesion in case there are bacteria feeding on the, the live flesh right next to the interface between the skeleton. And we've done this several times and we have about 70% success in stopping the lesion straight on, which is really exciting. It's rather time consuming and you kind of have to do it on scuba um, as opposed, you can't really do it on snorkel even in really shallow places just because you have to have your hands and face underwater. Unfortunately, if you go back to colonies where that treatment was successful, six months later, they have a new lesion in a different part of the colony. So it's kind of a temporary band-aid. It might be helpful if there's all of a sudden a really big spike, but in the long term, it's just a band-aid and it doesn't really address the underlying problem. Yeah. When you mentioned the red coral, the picture looks green. The Does it? Orange, but the red one looks green. It's, it's like, it's brick red, like a brick color. Um, Maybe it's just oh, on my screen. If you want to come up here, it looks a lot more red, but <laughs> it might just be the projector. Sorry, but I try to depict what the colors look like in my graphs. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you told me what, what different component is in, in the red color versus the brown one. Uh, I have not. I don't think anyone really has. I know one component that is different is the type of algal symbiont that is in them. So um, different types of algal symbionts are known to either be more thermal resistant or have a higher rate of photosynthesis. And I'm not 100% sure if that is driving the different colors. It's, I'm sure it's a component. Um, but there are other fluorescent proteins that are in corals. I couldn't name you the proteins that are different in these two color morphs, it's not really 
my area of expertise, but it's something that definitely should be investigated. How do you remove those? Are they still okay? Yeah, the cots, the crown of thorns. Um, so I know people poke them with sticks. I've not actually done this myself. And I imagine that they put them in game bags. And then I know that sometimes they kind of chop them up and I don't know if they use them for fertilizer or they're just sacrificed, but either they're removed from the reef and put somewhere else or they're actually physically removed from the reef and sacrificed. So, but they, that only occurs when their population explodes in a particular area. Yeah. I heard a news report that said our oceans the world around us become acidic. Are becoming more acidic, yes. And at one time they were neutral. Has this changed a lot of things that are happening like this? It is thought that it's, it's making diseases worse, either because bacteria can turn on different virulence factors in more acidic conditions. It certainly impairs coral growth because it takes a lot more energy for a coral to turn chemicals in the water into a calcium carbonate skeleton when it's more acidic. If it gets too acidic, it'll actually dissolve that skeleton and then it'll look like an anemone. That's like crazy acidic waters. We're nowhere near, near that. But um, certainly ocean acidity is a problem for coral reefs. And yeah, they think it's a stress on the coral and helping the pathogen that could mitigate disease. Yeah. How do you reverse this, the building up of the sea? Is this man? Um, it is linked to increased CO2 in the atmosphere. So if you have a higher partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere from man-made events and natural events that put CO2 in the air, more of it is going to get dissolved into the ocean and then through chemical processes, it turns into compounds that are release hydrogen, so make the water more acidic. Yep. Well, where you would have volcanic ash in the ocean coming out, does that really stop coral growth and do other damages? Um, I would say that those places where salt, like sulfides from sea mounts, those are in really deep waters where there aren't coral anyway, so if there's a broad impact, I'm not sure what to say, but a local impact, probably not because corals aren't where those chemicals are leaking up. Are those corals? These are coral skeletons. <laughs> um, none of them are Monticura capitata. Oh, no, this is. Yeah, so this is a coral skeleton. It's actually really similar to our own bones, such that they can actually use coral skeleton for bone grafts in humans. I've done that before. And yeah, you can the, the little holes in it. Uh, each place where there was a little coral polyp. And why is it white? All these are white. Why That's just that the color of the calcium carbonate. So the chemical itself is white. The tissue of the coral of the coral itself is clear. And then it turns brownish tan because of the atlas and bounds that are really dense in the cells. And then that dies off and it gets exposed to air? Or? Yeah, well in the water what happens is bacteria, fungus, small invertebrates, they start colonizing the skeleton, they start breaking it down, and then eventually where there was skeleton, it'll be nothing, it'll just be a nub. And that's bad for fish and invertebrates that rely on the coral kind of structure like this. You know, fish make their homes in all of these little pupas. So if that degrades away into a flat surface, then there's no home for those animals anymore. That coral sample is the rice coral? This is a rice coral skeleton, this one in particular. Yeah. yeah. We also have Hoslopora and Phrygis and Fungia. This is a coral that is one polyp. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> Give us the common names. Okay, so this one, the common name is the Hawaiian rice coral. This is a mushroom coral. Um, this is called a lace coral. Um, this is called a cauliflower coral. Uh, and this one, a nubby finger, finger coral. Yep. So all of these are really common. You can find them out here in the Bay. You can find particularly these guys in Kanyohe Bay. You can find these guys at like Electric Beach, North Shore, 
high and high wave action areas. You guys do really good. I love all these questions. Yeah. <laughs> You mentioned three separate outbreaks. Were there any, um, I guess, uh, regrowth? There is some growth. If you go back, you do start seeing little baby corals eventually. But you have to wait for the skeleton to break down, kind of fall down, and then flat substrate to be exposed. So it can take a while. Um, but definitely there has been a change since even I've been here that I've seen in some places around, say, Coconut Island, where, I'm, where I snorkel a lot. Last month when I was snorkeling on the left hand side down there, I swam to something that looked really big. It looked like eight feet long. It looked like um, five feet high. Like this guy? Shaped kind of like this guy? It, but big. I see all those palms, but yeah. Is yeah. that a coral? Yeah. So this particular, the, the finger coral, they can get really big. They grow really slowly, like really slowly for corals, but they can get massive. Some of the lobe shaped ones, they can several feet tall. Oh, huge. Yeah. And the next training here is June 3rd, right? For the eyes of reading? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I will be here to do a training on June 3rd. If you guys are interested in doing the full the full tour, as it were. <laughs> um, this is outside your area, but you know when the um, ship was um, destroying the reef, um, not far from Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. I think it was, and they planted the coral back. How was that doing? I have not heard whether that's doing okay. Um, I don't know whether it's taken hold or whether it's died back. I know, was that before or after the molasses spill? Oh, before. before. Because the molasses spill did a number on the reefs around there. So. <laughs> <clears throat> Any other questions? I'm here all day. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you for having me.